Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we explore convenient yet effective shortcuts that will help you get ahead and move forward faster by becoming a better leader. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert, and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Need a powerful and entertaining way to ignite your next conference retreat or team building session? My keynotes don't include magic, but they do have the power to help your attendees take a leap forward by putting emotional intelligence into their employee engagement, customer engagement, and customer-centric leadership practices. So bring the infotainment creativity of the Fast Leader Show to your next event, and I'll help your attendees get over the hump now. Go to beyondmorale.com forward slash speaking to learn more. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because I have somebody on the show today that gives a fresh perspective on some classic leaders. Jocelyn Davis grew up in a foreign service family, and at last count, she's lived in 29 neighborhoods in eight countries. Some of the places she has lived are Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Kingston, Jamaica, Newport, Rhode Island, Ventian, Laos, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Panama City, Florida, Boston, Massachusetts, and Toronto, Canada. After college, Jocelyn planned to be an academic, but she didn't like grad school, so she took off for Los Angeles, taking her soon-to-be husband with her, and got a job in publishing. In 1989, they moved to Boston, and she answered a classified ad for a copy editor at the Forum Corporation, a leadership and sales training firm. At that time, she'd never heard of the corporate learning industry. Jocelyn stayed at Forum for 20 years, working her way up to become the Executive Vice President of Research and Development. Her team was responsible for developing all the standard training products. One of her proudest achievements there was co-authoring her first book, Strategic Speed, published by Harvard Business Review Press, which argues that fast execution is all about the people stuff. Huh, doesn't that sound interesting? Today, Jocelyn is an independent consultant and author. Her passions are helping others learn and grow, leading creative teams, writing books, designing learning programs, and working at the intersection of business and the humanities. When she left Forum, she had a vision of a consulting business built on the idea of leadership as a liberal art. She thought, hey, I'll write a book to support the business. Turned out the book became the business. It's called The Greats on Leadership. It's 25 centuries of the best ideas for leaders featuring great thinkers and storytellers like Plato, Shakespeare, C.G. Jung, Jane Austen, and lots more. Jocelyn lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico with her husband, Matt, and daughter, Emily. Jocelyn Davis, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I am, Jim. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for being here. Now, I've given our listeners a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Sure. Yeah, my current passion is, well, you already mentioned it. It's it's this new book that I just came out with, The Great Song Leadership. And uh, that's what I'm all about at the moment. It's really about taking that book out to uh, leaders out there in the world uh, of all stripes and helping them become better leaders with uh, some of these ideas and great stories from ages past. Now, one of the things that I found interesting is that, uh, you know, we, we often talk about history and why do we study history so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing is one of our main objectives for for learning history. But when I started thinking about these classic leaders of leadership, it's like, I wanted to ask myself, how come we haven't figured all this stuff out already? <laughs> yeah, good question. There's a, the book actually starts out with a quote from Winston Churchill, who was a great leader and a great writer, a great author. And he said, the farther back, the farther backwards you can look, the farther forwards you're likely to see. And uh, I really believe that's true, you know, and and I think the the answer to your question, why haven't we figured it out yet is because I think often business people, everybody really is sort of a little too eager to be forward thinking and innovative. And that's what you're supposed to be as a business person is, you know, always looking for what's coming down the pike. But um, we sometimes forget that when you look backwards and you look at everything that's happened and these great thinkers and these great ideas and stories from the past, you know, it's all there. It's all there to be learned from. It's all there to be sort of gleaned. Um, so I think we, we often forget to do that and, and we should. You know, sometimes that, um, that look back could prevent us from taking a step forward if we don't have some type of confidence in that step that we take and we have to have some boldness and and a lot of the innovation of today you know is not occurring be, because of fear uh, and not taking that step forward so when you start talking about looking at some of these classic leaders and mm-hmm. having that that boldness uh, grit uh, you know so some of that that foresight to be able to know when to go i mean where do, where do you find it when you're looking back 
Yeah, yeah, great question. You know, that that's it's actually one of the main themes in in the book is this idea that um, a great leader can come from anywhere, that you don't need a you know a big title or thousands of followers on Twitter or the you know the corner office. You, you don't need that sort of those trappings of success or those um, that status, if you will, in the hierarchy in order to lead. And I'm really pretty passionate about this, this sort of getting this message out to people. And I think you, you, you learn this really from looking, from looking back at not just great leaders of the past, but great thinkers, great masterminds um, of the past, because you see that, you know, they're not talking about a, you know, a CEO. I mean, that's a pretty recent invention. The CEO, um, the, the modern day organization is, you know, only maybe a hundred years old. Um, so you're, you know, you look back at these great stories and you see all kinds of people, you know, just people of different genders and tribes and, and, um, personalities. And they're just these great stories and, and ideas that, that anybody can really latch onto and sort of feel, feel great about the impact that they're already making as a leader. And then maybe try to do even a little bit more. You know, as you were talking, I, I started thinking about two as I myself have studied, I wouldn't necessarily say leaders, but studied some folks that today, you know, we essentially re- revere as as famous. During their day and age and their time, they may have been so far out in front of the conventional wisdom and thinking that they were almost ostracized. So mm. when you were going and doing your research, I mean, were you finding that there are certain leaders that at the time when they were alive, they weren't considered leaders. However, you know, posthumously, you know, they all of a sudden gained this leadership wisdom. Yeah, that uh, interesting. You know, I, I, um, there were there were many uh, uh, authors that I looked at that are you know are famous today. So, um, and I was, you know, intentionally going for that, for people who are well-known, you know, Shakespeare and Plato and, um, you know, Churchill, we all know those names, but then I also found a few authors, thinkers that are not well-known at all today. And one of them is this guy named, um, uh, Theodore Dodge is his last name. And, and, uh, he was a Colonel in the, uh, uh, in the civil war in the United States, um, in the, in the civil war era. And then he became a, um, a professor, a university professor after that. And he wrote this book or a series of essays called the great captains. And it's about the great, uh, war hero or, you know, war, war leaders of the past, like Alexander the great and, um, Caesar and, um, Hannibal. Uh, and so Theodore Dodge, who was, he had been a soldier. He, you know, then became a, an academic. Nobody's ever heard of him. He's this, you know, obscure historian, but I, I put him in my book because he has these great, concise stories of these great captains of, you know, Hannibal and how he beat the Romans and Alexander the Great and and what he did. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I think sometimes we have to look to the lesser known, um, not just leaders, but the lesser known thinkers and and people who have, who have looked back at these great leaders and written about, pay attention to what they said. You know, I, th- I think you bring up a really interesting point on really one of the things about the fast leader show is that there's leaders among us. I mean, they're all over the place. And the beauty about what I get to do on the fast leader show is highlight those folks and the things that they've learned so that they can teach us all. And, you know, thanks for being one of those folks that are here, because I think you just saying that and pointing that out about Dodge is, is critically important. And I know it may not seem so related, but to me, I think it kind of fits. And this is just my oddball way of thinking. There was something that I was reading talking about the types of apples that we eat. And just like only 150, 200 years ago, there were like 200 or 300 varieties. And because of us only focusing on one or two, there's really only eight varieties that are currently really farmed. I mean, it's really small. It's, It's really amazing what we've done. And so I think that we can actually enrich and deepen our bounty if we seek and look for those lesser known leaders like you're talking about. And thanks for bringing them to light through your book. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Now, I know as doing, oh gosh, research and looking at, you know, these classics and looking at things that are, are not as known, uh, you probably have come across tons of different quotes. And we love those on the Fast Leader Show because they will help to inspire us and do a lot of different things. But is there one or two that kind of stands out for you that you can share with us? Yeah, there's um, there's one quote that I came across uh, several years ago. It's by Maya Angelou, who's the great poet. You know, she was the poet laureate of the United States for for a while. Um, and what she said, I mean, she said a lot of great things. But the the quote of hers that's my favorite is, "They'll forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel." And ever since uh, when I first heard that quote, it just took the top of my head off because I was I was like, wow, that is profound because that just says so much about how, you know, leaders make this mistake. Often I make this mistake of thinking that, oh, everybody's paying attention to what I'm saying and they're paying attention to what I'm doing and I've got to be really good and, you know, say all this good stuff and do all this good stuff. But really what that quote says to me is that nobody's going to remember any of that really. They might remember a little bit of it, but, but really what they remember is how you made them feel. Did you, did you inspire? Did you encourage? Did you make people feel like they could be leaders? You know, did you make them feel good or did you make them feel like crap? You know, that's, that's what it really comes down to when, when you're talking leadership. So I, I, I try to remember that quote. Yeah, I think that's a good point as far as uh, it's something that always has to be and, and, you know, brought back into the forefront of our mind because it is so easy to lose sight of that. So mm-hmm. th- thank you for sharing that. Now, I, I, you and I had the opportunity to chat about a, a couple different things previously, and, and I really enjoyed getting to meet you and know you know, learn, you know, know more about you. You know, we talk about humps and we've talked about a couple different humps amongst ourselves. Uh, but, you know, is is there a story that you can share with us that really will help us? get in a better direction like it did for you. Can you share that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to. And this is um, no question in my mind, when you said, you know, share a story of, of a hump or a challenge or a struggle, th- there's, there's the one story that immediately comes to mind for me, which is um, the story of how I got fired from the company that I had worked for, for 20, 20 plus years. Um, and then went on to sort of, um, uh, get past that and, and, you know, move on to other things. But the, the interesting thing about, about that whole experience, one of the many interesting things is that, um, I had written a book at that company, um, several years back and I was really proud and pleased of that with that book, uh, strategic speed It's called, you mentioned it earlier. Um, and I was, you know, leading up to this, this, uh, sort of, um, issue where, uh, a, a new, um, new regime came in and sort of things went awry and I ended up getting fired for insubordination of all things, which was, um, I kind of feel proud of that now, actually, cause I've, I'm not a very insubordinate person. And so the fact that I got fired for insubordination is sort of makes me, uh, makes me chuckle a little bit, but, um, leading up to that, that point, I was, you know, I was an executive, I was, uh, you know, head of R and D I'd written this book, co-authored this book. Um, and it was very easy to get that book published. And I thought at the time, oh, it's because, uh, you know, it's such a great book and, um, and they, the, the, Harvard Business Press loved it. And, and you know, and, and it is a good book, I think, and I'm sure they did love it. But um, what the, the, what sort of was the rude awakening for me after I got shown the door was that um, I realized when I decided to write my next book, I, I realized pretty quickly that I no longer had a platform. I no longer was a, you know, an executive at a consulting firm with a platform that would allow me to quickly sell another book. So it was a real, uh, you know, cold water in the face for me, I guess when I, when I, cause I left and I was like, Oh, you know, no problem. Okay. That, you know, I got fired. That's, you know, kind of a drag, but, but, you know, it's okay because I'm going to, you know, go on and write my next book and have my own business and be independent. Um, but I quickly discovered that as I started to try to sell this next book to, uh, publishers that they were like, well, you know, who are you? You're not famous. You're not 
an executive, you're not, you know, with a company anymore. So you don't have what they call a platform. So I had to really sort of take a step back and say, okay, what am I going to do here? Am I going to persist and try to build that that credibility that, you know, and kind of do, do, do it on my own, you know, really do it on my own. I thought I had done it on my own before, but I really hadn't. I had done it, you know, based on being a part of this company and having this title. And I realized that I no longer had that title. I no longer had that platform. So I was going to have to do it um, based on, you know, <laughs> other things like, like just being really, really persistent and, uh, and resilient, I guess. So that's what I did. And it took me, uh, it took me two years to write the book and two years to sell it. So I was writing and selling, trying to sell, um, all along through that whole period. And really the answer at the end of the day was, um, was just that, that sheer persistence thinking, you know, realizing that I was going to get a lot of no's, but eventually, eventually I would get a yes. And, and eventually I did get a yes. So, um, that, that's, uh, that's my hump. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I know, you know, you and I had kind of talked about how a lot of those things, you know, had kind of strung together uh, in regards to, you know, you, you term being terminated and then, you know, trying to get the book sold. And, uh, one of the things that you didn't share that you share with me is that there was a lot of rejection along the way. It wasn't a situation where, right. I mean, you, you know, you were, you were continuing to, you know, beat the pavement uh, on trying to get that thing. Uh, published. And, you know, it, a lot of people are probably sitting there and saying, well, gosh, you know, it's easy. You know, all you have to do is just self-publish. Um, and, you know, that's not as easy as it seems to be either. There's a lot of uh, romantic, you know, romantic thoughts about, you know, the whole self-publishing concept, but it still comes down to if you want to sell, you still have to have the platform. And a traditional publishers, as well as self-publishing, the difference between a book that is recognized and one that isn't comes down to the marketing and promote promotion aspects of it. And traditional, you know, the traditional yes. publishing houses, they're not good promoters and marketers. I mean, that's still left to the person who writes the book, even though it may have gotten published. Right. That's right. And, and, you know, it's uh, funny because you were, I know you were going to ask, I think you're going to ask about an epiphany that I had um, in connection with this, this story and the epiphany that I had was actually related to, to what you just said about self-publishing, because I, I got, you're, you're right. I got so many rejections. Um, I even, I, I went out, I got a literary agent. First, I thought I could do it on my own, um, go directly to publishers that didn't work. So I thought, well, I'll, tr I'll get a literary agent. That's a whole process filled with rejection in itself, but, you know, eventually made it through that, got the agent and then thought, hooray, I've made it now. I've got an agent now. It's smooth sailing. Well, and my agent was not able to sell the book either. So, um, so that again, you know, another huge splash of cold water in the face, but then, so then the epiphany for me came after my agent said, you know what, I don't think we're going to be successful in selling this book. So, you know, no hard feelings. We parted ways. And I thought to myself, well, you know what, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying to get a traditional publisher, but I also realized that if I needed to self-publish, then I was going to be absolutely okay with that. So there was sort of a, a, a mental shift. And I really think this kind of, <laughs> this uh, says something about acceptance or just, you know, really being okay with, with wherever you are right now. Because I, I, I remember thinking to myself, you know what? I, I may have to end up self-publishing this book. And if I do, that is absolutely okay because I believe in the book. I believe in what I've done. I know I can do it. I know I can get it out there and, and it'll be okay. And I think that somehow that sort of made the universe, this sounds sort of crazy, but I think it sort of made the universe shift a little bit um, because the next day, I, and I, I went back and I, I Googled, you know, self publishers and hybrid publishers and little publishers and independent publishers. And I was just Googling around and I, and I came across these two um, British based publishers that just sort of, there was something about them that I thought, huh, these seem like, you know, they're my people. Um, so I reached out to them and 
almost immediately got responses back from both of them saying, yes, we're interested. We'd like to see a proposal. Um, and then went forward with um, Nicholas Breeley, which was the uh, one that, um, you know, ended up really, really liking the book a lot. Um, so it, it and, you know, then the rest was history and then they published it and then were bought by Hachette, which is one of the big five publishers. Um, so that was uh, fortuitous. But the, the point is just that my epiphany was, was realizing that at some point in a process like this, you have to just make peace with what you've done and, you know, whether or not anybody buys it, whether or not anybody, you know, gives you money for it. You, you just, you need to like be okay with what you've done. I think finding that place as well as you also had the persistence to keep going. I mean, you, you found the place, but you still kept going. So it wasn't right. like you used it as a, <laughs> as an approval to quit. So good for That's you. That's right. It, no, exactly. It wasn't, it wasn't about saying, okay, I'm okay. And now I quit. It was just that, you know, I'm going to keep going and whatever happens, it'll be okay. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing to point out here is that don't, don't give yourself the, the, uh, the okay to quit because mm -hmm. I mean, time and time again, when you start looking at a lot of people who have found success, it's because of the persistence piece. It is not because of the permission piece. That's right. But, you know, you're you're absolutely right, Jim, that there are so many ways these days to be successful and, and not just in publishing, but in any endeavor. You know, there's just new ways to get your message out there to, you know, to uh, whether you're an entrepreneur or you want to be part of a large company or, you know, you want to be a driver for Uber or, you know, whatever you want to do. There's just so many different ways now to to do it. So I think for me, it was also about that uh, agility. So knowing that I was going to keep moving forward and, you know, so I, I had that goal in mind, but there were different ways that I could get there. And, you know, maybe it would be one way, maybe it would be another way, but that, that was okay because I knew what the, what the end goal was. Well, I know you've got uh, a lot of things that are going on, of course, the book and promoting the book and, you know, your consulting practice. And, uh, so, but if you start looking at all of those things, what are some of your goals? Uh, let's see. So, um, my main goal is to uh, frankly, just get this book in, into as many people's hands as I can. Um, the other is to, um, uh, sort of a sub goal, if you will, is to uh, develop training. So, uh, you know, a learning program that, that goes with the book, because that's something that I know how to do. That's what I've done my whole life or my whole professional life is uh, build learning programs. And so, um, uh, so I'm working on that. And again, I'm hoping that I will be able to partner with, um, with a company to an existing company to do that, but if that doesn't work out. I'll be okay doing it on my own. Um, but I really want to, you know, get a, um, get it, get the book out there in several different forms. The ideas in the book, get them out there in several different forms. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy to use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Jocelyn, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Jocelyn Davis, are you ready to hoedown? I am. All right. So what do you think is holding you back from being an even better leader today? <laughs> What's holding me back is my extremely introverted personality, which means that I, um, I don't really enjoy or I find it tiring to be sort of out there talking to people and, uh, uh, you know, um, interacting with, with lots of people all the time. And, you know, when you're a leader trying to be a leader, that's, uh, you know, you do need to interact with people, right? <laughs> so you can't just sit in a room and, and write books. So that's, uh, that's what holds me back. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? The best leadership advice I've ever received is, is from Lao Tzu, who is a sixth century BC Chinese philosopher. He wrote the Tao Te Ching, very famous uh, uh, work of philosophy, poetry. And he has a verse in the Tao Te Ching that says, of the master, when his work is done, his tasks fulfilled, the people will say, 
We did it ourselves. What is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? Um, secret that contributes to my success is I think that I do things that scare me. So I'm, I'm often scared to do things, but I made a vow to myself many, many years ago that I was never going to let that stop me. Being scared of something was not going to stop me. So I do things that scare me. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? <laughs> okay. So this is, this is not a tool actually, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, because she is, it's a person, she's not a tool. It's my daughter. Um, I think that being a parent, being, having a, having a child, um, is one of the, uh, greatest learning leadership learning experiences one could ever have. And, uh, my daughter, although again, she's not a tool, she's a person, but, um, but she just, um, teaches me every day how to be a better leader. What would be one book that you'd recommend to our listeners? And it could be from any genre. Okay. So I'm going to recommend, uh, well, of, of course I would recommend my book, the great sound leadership. So there's that one, but the other one that I would recommend is, is a book that I talk about, uh, in the great sound leadership, which is surprisingly Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And everybody, when, when I talk about this book, everybody's like, that's not a leadership book. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? But I, I will tell you, Frankenstein is one of the best books for leaders that anybody could ever read because it is all about um, a leader who fails miserably at um, engaging with this, this thing, this creature that he's created, that he's built. And it's, it's about this, this scenario that so many leaders run into is when you've created this, this thing, this project, you've done something bold, you've done something new and it's not working out. And what do you do? Um, and Frankenstein is all about a leader who um, really does the wrong thing. He, he does not talk with his monster. And what I, what I say is that uh, if you're a leader, you've got to get comfortable talking with your monsters because that's what real courage is. Okay, Fast Leader listeners, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net forward slash Jocelyn Davis. Okay, Jocelyn, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25. And you've been given the opportunity to take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take everything. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? So I would take back the knowledge that it's really never about me, that when there's a conflict or when things are um, going wrong or, you know, somebody's screaming at you or, um, you know, whatever there's, you know, th things are just, you know, going awry. You have to remember that it is all about the, the other person. It's about helping that other person through whatever it is they're going through. And you can't always do that. You know, you can't always, you know, make everything right, but, but it's really important to understand that, you know, they're not, you know, they're not really thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. So if you're a leader, you need to re realize this is not about me. I need to focus on that person, help them. And that's what it means to be a leader. Jocelyn, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Uh, sure. You can go to my website, which is jocelynrdavis.com. Jocelyn Davis, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>